everyone. I am so pleased to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's Reshaping Rochester program. On behalf of the Community Design Center, uh, our directors and staff, I uh, welcome you to the Rochester uh, Lecture Series. My name, as you all know, is Maria Fergiwelli, and I am the Executive Director of the Community Design Center. In 2015, the theme for the lecture series was Balancing the Scales, Equity by Design. This is where we first began to explore the intersection between placemaking and equity. We believe that the theme of this year's lecture series, Building a Just Community, can be a catalyst for much needed conversations and an inspiring action that can have a positive impact on our community. All of our programs for 2021 support this theme. The Community Design Center of Rochester was founded in 2003 and is celebrating nearly two decades of service to the greater Rochester region. We promote design excellence and sustainability in the built environment through advocacy, education, and grassroots community facilitation. I'd like to take this moment to introduce you to our board members. Bill Price, Monica McCullough, Stephanie Anunziata, Vanessa Villeneuve, Natalie Anderson, Eugenio Marlin, Howard Decker, and Tanya Zwilin. We thank you all for your commitment, your guidance, and support. I'd like to take this moment to recognize NISCA for their longstanding support of the Community Design Center. And I'd like to also take a moment to recognize our Circle of Friends members who are persons or businesses that have made a commitment of sustained support to our organization. We gratefully acknowledge their support. We extend an invitation to any of you who value the work of the Design Center to join our circle. I'd like to acknowledge Home Leasing as our presenting sponsor for the series this year and has been the presenting sponsors for the past four years. So we're very grateful for their support. We gratefully acknowledge the ESL Charitable Foundation for their generous support of the series. And at this time, I'd like to invite Eric Van Dusen to say a few words. Thanks, Maria. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Eric Van Dusen, Senior Community Impact Relationship Manager at ESL. I'd first like to thank the Design Center for hosting Reshaping Rochester for what is now its 16th year. Like years past, the presentations and topics covered through this series are necessary for our community as we seek to learn and understand how to best plan and design a community and its neighborhoods in a way that ensures that they are connected, equitable, and inclusive for all. At ESL, as part of our efforts to help our community thrive and prosper, we reinvest in our community in ways that seeks to build a healthy, resilient, and equitable Greater Rochester for all. We believe that one of the tenets to accomplishing this is through building strong neighborhoods, which includes making sure housing is affordable and neighborhoods are strong and connected. We support organizations such as the Design Center because of their dedication to building healthy, sustainable communities that work towards making neighborhoods stronger. This work and the discussion around it are necessary to move our community forward. When we build, renovate, and repair, we must evolve in ways that ensure all who inhabit a space have the opportunities to live in a way that meets their unique needs. Through Reshaping Rochester, we are honored to support the presentations and conversations from some of our country's leading minds in community planning and design. It is our hope and goal that as we learn, our thinking and actions evolve to ensure we are creating the most equitable version of Greater Rochester possible. Where we seek to understand our communities and neighborhoods and design in a way that lifts up and celebrates their characteristics. Thank you again to the Design Center for hosting this series for 16 years. 
And thank you to the other sponsors for supporting this important series. Thank you, Commissioner Silver, for what we know will be an engaging and inspiring presentation. And of course, thank you to all of you for attending. Your dedication, commitment to sustainable, healthy community design is what will keep Greater Rochester on a path to progress. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Eric. I'd like to also at this time uh, acknowledge the Community Preservation Corporation for their continued support as a gold level sponsor. I'd like to invite Miriam Zinter to say a few words. Thank you, Maria. We are pleased to support the Community Design Center who encourages smart, equitable and inclusive design throughout Rochester and the surrounding communities. The Community Preservation Corporation or CPC was founded in New York City in 1974 to be a source of stable capital and a resource to underserved communities impacted by blight and abandonment during a time when other institutions either would not or could not invest in them. A significant amount of this work has been within the communities that have long suffered from institutional racism and neglect. Today, as one of the largest community development financial institutions in the country, we are dedicated to investing in multifamily housing and have provided more than $11.5 billion to finance over 200,000 units of housing across New York State and the Northeast United States. In the summer of 2020, in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak and the Black Lives Matter and social justice movements, CPC launched the Acquiring Capital and Capacity for Economic Stability and Sustainability, or ACCESS. ACCESS is a new program which provides $20 million to provide financial resources, capacity building opportunities, and pre-development support to entrepreneurs of color who have historically faced barriers to entry in the real estate development market with the goal of promoting and enabling greater racial diversity, equity, and inclusion in the industry. The $20 million, which is fully funded by CPC, is strategically allocated to address barriers to entry disproportionately experienced by people of color. And this includes capacity building programs, subordinate soft debt and recoverable grants, pre-development and acquisition loans, construction and permanent debt capital, as well as providing equity capital within these developments. Thank you so much Community Design Center for supporting these goals and supporting our community. We look forward to today's presentation by Commissioner Mitchell Silver. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam, for sharing uh, information about CPC and especially the ACCESS program. I would like to say special thanks to the City of Rochester, in particular, the Department of Environmental Services and the Neighborhood Development Department for their longstanding support of the Community Design Center. And thank you for being our event sponsor today. We will hear a little later from Commissioner Norm Jones and hopefully the mayor will be introducing our speaker. Currently, I'd like to acknowledge all of our previous and future event sponsors, Haveron and Company, Reconnect Rochester, and the Greater Rochester Association of Realtors for their generous support. Special thanks to our exclusive media sponsor, WXXI, and to AIA Rochester for being the sponsor for the professional development credits. We are grateful to all of our supporting sponsors and lecture series friends. We thank you for your continued support. And we are, of course, always very, very grateful. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the unsung heroes that have made the series possible. The CDCR staff, in particular, Monica Reifenstein, who is our Zoom wizard behind the scenes. She makes sure everything runs smoothly. And our lecture planning committee, of course, our board of directors as well. This is just a quick reminder to please take our survey at the end of the presentation. Your feedback is important in helping us to plan our future programs. 
Now, these following slides are for those that would like to get professional development credits. This presentation is approved for APA and AICP professional development credits, as well as AIACES credits. If you wish to receive credit for this presentation, please note the Google Doc that Monica has posted in the chat or email Monica directly. Here you see a brief description of the course content. And these are the learning objectives for today's presentation. Every year, the Community Design Center designates one of the lectures as the Larry Stid Memorial Lecture. We are grateful to have several members of Larry Stid's family here with us today, Mary, Larry's wife, and Jeffrey, his son. Thank you for joining us today. At this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Norm Jones to say a few words. Um, th thank you, Maria, and thank you, Community Design Center, for the, the work you do and the, the, the continued commitment to our community. Larry Stitt, I've had the privilege and honor to work with Larry for, for many years, and I always found him to be very approachable, agreeable, and someone that you can really learn so much about community planning uh, from. Here are some key points about Larry. Larry worked for the city of Rochester from 1978 through November, 2005 in the Ryan and Johnson administrations. He held the positions of chief of comprehensive planning from 1978 to 1987. He was the director of planning from 1987 to 2003 and his final position was the Deputy Commissioner of Community, Develop, uh, Community Development from 2003 to 2005. Some of his major accomplish, accomplishments include coordinating all city planning initiatives, uh, the neighbor planning process, including the NBN process in 1995, the city's comprehensive plan, the Renaissance Plan 2010 and 1998, the Waterfront Development Plan in 1992 and the Center City Master Plan in 2002. Larry developed many key collaborations with neighborhood groups across the city. He identified initial funding for the Community Design Center of, the, of, the, of Rochester. So he was uh, very instrumental in, in starting uh, this actual organization off. He initiated many design charrettes that led to many of the of some pro uh, following major projects like Brooks Landing, the South Wedge, and Cornell Landing. He initiated the College Town project. He also was able to leverage many internal city departmental resources to get many projects into the planning phase. And that's very important, being able to uh, cross the actual departmental boundaries and work together as one team to get many things done. And Larry was quite efficient at doing that. Larry hired and developed many very talented uh, staff people. Um, it, was, it was important to know one of the, the earlier panelists, uh, Miriam Zenter, was working and was hired by Larry Stitt, I believe. Larry died un unexpectedly at the age of 66 uh, in November 2005 while still in employment with the city of Rochester. One, of, uh, one personal note I, I noticed about Larry before riding your bicycle to work was prevalent and everyone did it, Larry always rode his bike to work. Um, a, a amazing human being, a great guy to work with, humble and very knowledgeable, and he taught me a lot about sprawl. So um, I, I really um, am honored to be able to, to talk about Larry, um, and it's, it's just really um, thanking his, the family for allowing Larry to work with us for so many years. And many of the projects that he is accomplish uh, that, that, it, that he started are now in fruition and that we're finishing off. That being said, I now have the opportunity to introduce my boss, um, the Honorable Mayor, lovely A. Warren, who will talk to you about what we're doing in the city of Rochester and also introduce the keynote speaker. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Appreciate the opportunity to join you all here today with the Community Design Center. 
I want to take uh, a moment to thank Maria for her leadership and her team for being such great partners to each and every one of us. And of course, for today's lecture series. Today we talk in particular special, uh, today's talk is especially special to me and I know our city since it is the annual Larry Stead Memorial Lecture. As many of you know, Larry was a deputy commissioner in our former Department of Community Development and a key city planner who helped author our prior comprehensive plan. Much of his vision can be seen throughout the city of Rochester today. So it is my honor to join you for this important event. And I definitely want to thank his family for joining us as well. I also, again, want to acknowledge the Community Design Center for your very important role and for fostering collaboration and diversity. We, are, we were excited in 2020 to receive the, um, the Reshaping Rochester Award for Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial Park as well as for the partnership we had with the town of Brighton on the Highland Crossing Trail. Both of those were extraordinary awards and we're excited to hopefully be able to receive more in 2021. As you know, our commitment to rebuilding neighborhoods and building affordable housing is seen throughout our community. And when you think about the development that's taking shape in every corner of our neighborhoods, it's very important to note that the Community Design Center have been an integral partner in all of that. Um, when we think about your support of Joseph Avenue and uh, the fact that now we're working with the Avenue Box Theater to bring Art Walk to Joseph Avenue with our children, as well as Rena Golden, uh, the work that we're doing in Cornhill with repairing the West River Wall and La Marquetta, as well as on East Main Street with a number of different events that um, we have planned, uh, not just for the reshaping of the East Main Street interlude, but also looking to the north uh, and looking with our hinge neighbors, as well as Grove Place and, uh, of course, Market View Heights to develop a neighborhood that's very, very important to our entire community and making sure that it's equitable, making sure that we are including everyone as part of the solution to rebuilding our community. Uh, the Community Design Center has been uh, very integral in, in making sure that Rochester continues to put equity at the front and also complete streets and design into everything that we're doing. And you can see that as you're walking around uh, the city of Rochester. We are thankful today to have Mitchell Silver, who is the commissioner of New York City Parks Department, because we know that he has a a, a clear understanding of rebuilding communities and making sure that communities are greener and also available for everyone to be able to use. He is one of our nation's foremost leaders in urban planning, evident by the success he created in Raleigh, North Carolina, which has become one of America's fastest growing and most successful cities. I'm excited to hear his insights. I know that our team at the city of Rochester is excited as well, and that we can hopefully apply some of his insights to the things that we are trying to do here in Rochester. I wanna thank our city of Rochester team uh, for the work that they did and working in combination with the Community Design Center and many of you that are on this call to implement the Rochester 2034 plan, our new comprehensive plan. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to today's speaker, Mitchell, Mitchell Silver. Thank you so much, Mayor Warren, for that introduction. Uh, I'm now going to transition to my slides and I am so excited to be here virtually. Uh, well, first, uh, let me just start by saying, as the mayor stated, uh, I'm a planner by training. And in 2014, the mayor reached out to me to see if I joined the team. And uh, initially I was reluctant because I'm a planner and said, uh, not sure if I could run a parks department, but I brought a planner's perspective. I have to tell you, uh, after being on the job for a year and all my colleagues in planning said, oh, you sell out, how did you leave planning and go to parks? But I realized after a year, people literally hug you for opening a park. I mean, literally hug you. And I've been a planner for a long time and no one ever hugged me for creating a comprehensive plan. So I told planners, if you want a hug, uh, open up a park. Well, I'm so excited uh, to be here to present this presentation. Uh, I do want to start out by saying that we 2020 was a tough year, a really tough year. It was this age of disruption from political to economic, racial and social unrest, 
and of course, a global pandemic. Our residents, your residents have been going through a lot, trying to deal with this disruption. I'm just so excited that 2021 so far is a very different year. And now we're beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel, but there are still some issues we have to deal with in this country and I'm sure in your city. So the big question is knowing that we have all this disruption, what can parks and public space do? We all know through the pandemic that people were gravitating to these public spaces, even when on lockdown or pause, but parks and public spaces really became quite special. And so I'm gonna talk about those values of equity, inclusion, and access. And at the end, talk a little bit about Rochester, what I was able to see uh, virtually uh, to see how we can establish a path going forward. Well, the one thing I do wanna emphasize the value of parks in the 21st century. They're not just green spaces. These are public spaces for people. And it's not just an amenity, but now they're becoming part of the city's essential infrastructure. Depending on where you are, it could be the first line of defense. That's the case here in New York City. We're a city, uh, a coastal city surrounded by water. And parks aren't just for physical health, but we have to remember they're for mental health as well. And parks create huge economic benefits. So for today's conversation, I wanna share with you what we've been doing in New York City. I've been here for seven years. I'll be stepping down in a couple of months since my term comes to a close. We focused on five strategic initiatives, but I'm just gonna focus on two for the sake of this conversation. And we, from the very beginning, uh, started dealing with equity access inclusion, as well as planning and placemaking, something I brought to the Parks Department uh, with a planner's perspective. Let me talk about equity first. Now, I hear a lot of definitions about equity. Uh, for me to communicate what it meant to the public, I wanted to come up with one word. And that one word for equity, when we talk about it, is fairness. Are we fair about how we distribute our capital resources throughout the entire city, or do we pay more attention to downtown, knowing every neighborhood needs a quality park? Are we fair about how we maintain our parks? So fairness is that measure that we wanna make sure as we do our work, are we being fair? And that became the measuring stick that we used as I came in to the Parks Department to see how equitable we've been. Now, the mayor wanted me to come up with this very quickly. Uh, within the first six months, we came up with this framework for an equitable future, and we've been implementing it ever since. In order to find out how equitable we've been, what we decided to do was take a look and to measure to see how fair we've been. New York City spent a lot of money, we love our parks, over two decades, 20 years, New York City spent close to $6 billion improving our parks. We added more acreage and came up with this walk score. We wanted every New Yorker to be within a walk to a park. Right now it's 81.5%, we'd like to get it to 85% by 2030. But when I came commissioner, this was the old metric under the previous mayor, to me, it wasn't just about proximity, it was about quality because as you'll see in some of the slides, I can take a walk to that park in my neighborhood, but I will not let my child or grandchild step foot in that public space. So we have to be careful when we come up with these metrics about a walk to a park. It's not just about proximity, it's about quality. And so we wanted to find out, well, how equitable have we been? 20 years, $6 billion, how many parks within New York City received little to no investment over 20 years and it turned out there were 215 of our 2,000 parks. Here are parks hiding in plain sight and groups would see other parks getting invested in, yet theirs were left behind. From kindergarten to college, nothing changed in that park. And the mayor and I said, that's not fair, and it had to change. So we focused all of our attention and all these neighborhoods weren't a surprise, they were all underserved communities, and we decided to change that equation. To the mayor's credit, he gave me a, a down payment to recreate, wholly recreate 67 of the 215 parks. And I cannot begin to tell you the impact it's having on those communities because here in New York, it's a very dense city. Parks are your front yard, your backyard, your outdoor living room, your social gathering spaces where people connect, fall in love. And so we wanted to make sure that every neighborhood had a quality park. So I'm gonna give you some examples. Here's your Robert Moses era. Uh, playground. By the way, Robert Moses' office is behind that door. That's our conference room. Uh, and this is your New York City playground. High fence, asphalt, not a blade of grass. This is what I grew up in, but this was considered your walk to a park. Uh, this is not a place that I'd want to have my children play in. In fact, I did growing up, and my scraped knees can show you what it looked like. 
but is this a park or a parking lot? I mean, this is in New York City. When I came back to New York City, this is what our park system looked like. Now, this one's a little bit better because you have trees and a bench. So I assume you can go there and have a picnic, maybe propose to someone. Once again, this is your walk to a park. So we knew we had to do a lot better. It wasn't fair for other parks to be transformed. And this is what New York City parks look like. So we decided to take a whole new design approach on these parks. We wanted to put in spray features. New York can get very hot. These could be fun in the wintertime, but more fun in the summertime. Adult fits equipment that people can get outdoors and enjoy themselves and connect. We wanted to focus on having vibrant colors, get away from that gray asphalt. These are the centers of communities and want people to be excited, see them from a distance and go there and enjoy themselves. So a lot of color, a lot of features to show that these are alive and vibrant public spaces. The community was saying, please break up the asphalt. We need to see green. We know how therapeutic it is to green, green space for just 10 minutes. It reduces stress, it reduces anxiety, but also, these are also, we use these to collect stormwater. So they serve multiple purposes, not just a mental health benefit, but the environmental benefit as well. And then we wanna keep a focus on seating. We're now quadrupling the amount of our seating in all of our parks, because one, we have an aging population. They like to sit outdoors. We want them to age gracefully. They tend to sit at the edge of parks, but we want these to be social spaces. We look carefully at the seating tables and benches. We have areas where there is no chair, so you can have either a stroller or a wheelchair. We want these to be gathering places and encourage people to come to parks. And so seating, 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 a variety of it is within all our parks. So it's a very exciting change. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples, uh, one before and after, then a couple after. Uh, this park, Garrison Park, which has now been renamed to uh, Antonetti Park, uh, is right next to a community college in the South Bronx, a tough place. Uh, and so this was a park that was neglected for 20 years plus. Now, this picture, unlike the others, did have some vegetation in it. Uh, and you can see very foreboding. We're trying to eliminate stairs to get into parks. We want to make sure it is accessible to everyone, stroller, wheelchair, the elderly. And so this was the entrance coming in very foreboding. And like I said, this park did have some vegetation. It wasn't all asphalt. Unfortunately, it looked like this. This broke my heart. And as a commissioner, I was embarrassed. When I say I would not let my child or grandchild step foot in a public space, that's what I mean. How can this exist this long and no one pay attention? So we sought out to change it. We went through a whole design process. There's only one stair now. There are now three at-grade entrances. So seniors, strollers, people with a cane can come and enjoy the space. It's multi-generational. Since it's near the college, we designed this nice green space where students can connect and study, a seating area for seniors, splash pads for the kids. This is now truly a welcoming space for all. This is what the design looked like. You now see the community college in the background. And I'm pleased to say we opened it during COVID. School is not open. This is what it looks like from what you saw before to today. And I can't wait for the students to return. Their jaws will drop when they now realize they have a new public space that they can engage in. This is what fairness looks like. Now, the next slide I'm gonna share with you is one that was right near a senior center. There was no sitting area for people to enjoy and be there with uh, their loved ones. So we decided to create the seating area and I'll never forget opening day. This grandmother came up to me in a wheelchair, grabbed my hand, said, Commissioner, thank you. I'm gonna live longer because of you. Because I sit here with my daughter in this beautiful seating area and I watch my grandsons play basketball. And there it is. You actually see the church and the senior center in the background. This is what's changing lives. This was also a public space, all asphalt, lots of grade changes. And now it's providing uh, therapy uh, and beauty for the family and the children neglected for 20 years. Now this is an asset in the community where people can just thrive and feel alive. The next slide I'm gonna show you is always emotional for me because this is another asphalt playground in Brooklyn that we transform synthetic track. Uh, we have, sorry, th synthetic turf, a track, beautiful uh, landscaping, but a little boy about eight years old, he was Hispanic. He would not go into that park opening day. I asked one of my staff members to go speak to this young boy because why wouldn't he come in? Balloons, very festive. The little boy said he didn't want to go into the park because he didn't know how much it cost 
it looked that nice. He thought he had to pay to go into that park because he hadn't seen anything like that in his neighborhood. That broke my heart. There's a park and there's a little boy running around the track. His life and all the children in his community is going to change. He thought he had to pay because it looked that nice. We have to make sure that we provide world-class quality public spaces for all the residents. And so this is, this is a moment I will never forget and it drives me to continue to do more and more for the community. I also remember there was a gentleman in Staten Island, we were doing this playground park in Staten Island and he came up to me, he says, what are you doing here? And I was like, what are you talking about? I said, what are you doing here? I thought nobody cared. I lived here my whole life and no one came here to help improve this park. So this is the impact of this project. Uh, and then we decided to go a step further. Uh, this, we looked at all of our municipal pools next to public housing and it looked horrible. I mean, it was not a pleasant place to go. And so we sat down with our staff and said, you know something, we did this pool for 150,000. We took our staff, we got volunteers, we got paint donated. We wanted to provide dignity to the residents that use this pool in the summer. And it went from what you see here to this, $150,000, both in kind and donations. We call it cool pools. We want people to be cool, but also to be cool. And so this is now uh, 16 of our pools have been transformed. Usership went up by 50%. We didn't just want to create a pool. We want to create a place. And now the community calls this the resort, adding dignity to how people can enjoy themselves. And now the place is packed. Uh, we have to actually have a queuing line. Uh, so while people are waiting to get into the pool, and this is just bringing so much joy to residents because we understood it wasn't fair the way the municipal pools looked before. So we've completed 55 of the 67 pools. I'm sorry, we finished 55 of the 67 parks. Uh, we now have friends group that help care for these public spaces. And as I stated, both of the pools and the parks have increased usership by 50% and the public is just elated. So that's our equity initiative. I'm now gonna shift over to access. And for me, when I say access, we want to be free of physical, cultural, financial, and legal barriers, because to be to have access means that we want people to enjoy our public spaces and get into them. I have the saying that people may eat and sleep in their homes or apartments, but they live, they thrive in a public realm. Now, when we look at different generations, older generations like myself, we're consumers of goods, but the newer generations are consumers of experiences. So I challenge my staff and so you all know, uh, when I was in Raleigh, we had an urban design center. And even then our focus to them, as it is now in the parks department, is I don't just wanna be designers and planners. I want us to be experienced builders because that's why people come to public space. I went through some of the parks and downtown spaces. People are craving experiences in these public spaces. That's where we meet, where we connect, where we have fun. So the focus is not just about uh, planning something and based on land uses or pursuing consumer goods is finding those experiences. So here's an example. Uh, this is uh, in the Flatiron District. That's the Flatiron Building. It's right next to Madison Square Park. My predecessor in the transportation department started taking this underperforming asphalt and bringing it to life, reimagining the public space by putting chairs, by putting tables, by putting flowers and trees, recreated what was a road into now one of the exciting public spaces in New York. And so it's something that we're beginning to look at. When I go to certain cities and speak, they say, well, we don't have any land to acquire parks. I said, do you have streets? They go, yeah, well, then you can have a park. It's just reimagining how you use that public space. In New York City, parks represents 14% of the city's footprint, but streets, sidewalks, bike lanes, plazas, that represents another 26%. 40% of New York City is in the public realm. And the average citizen does not know if they're walking on the parks department jurisdiction property or Department of Transportation, and they don't care. They just want to have public space. There's a space, again, I just share with you on an aerial view, that's on the jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation. The public doesn't care, they're not asking. And so we want to make sure, how do we create this seamless public realm where it's all connected because that's where people have fun and that's where they thrive. So we started taking a fresh look at our public realm. Uh, this is a sidewalk. Uh, this is in Rufus King Park in Queens. And I love something that Umstead said. He said the sidewalk adjacent to the park 
should be considered the outer park. And it turns out that parks has jurisdiction of the sidewalks adjacent to the park. So I told my staff, we have to start reimagining our sidewalks. So you all know this is gonna be a bioswale. We'll collect stormwater and be reintegrated. New York is fence happy. We love our gates and fences. And there's a cute little dog just wants to smell some grass, but we put a fence around the open space. This person has to walk probably another five minutes to go into this park to enjoy it. So we knew we had to change it. As I said, New York is fence happy. This one I don't get. I assume they thought the tree was gonna run away at night. So we put a fence around it. Uh, the trees did not run away and we did take the fence down. And now this is a beautiful seating area that the public can enjoy. When we launched this whole idea about providing more access and taking fences. New Yorkers didn't take too, too well. Oh, it's, the park's gonna be unsafe. You can't put a fence around it. Uh, and I said, you know, we have to make this change. So here is a seating area in one of our pools. Uh, this is where kids go for summer camp uh, to have lunch, but it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. Why are we putting our children in prison just to have something to eat? It was not dignified and we knew that we had to start changing our fences and so we lowered them. And this is one of our cool pool uh, transformations and you can see how more open it is, how you can see inside because we wanted to have more visual accessibility but also accessibility across the board. That gave birth to this concept called Parks Without Borders. Very simply, uh, this was an initiative that was launched as a pilot. It's now part of our philosophy in all the parks that we do. We do this Parks Without Borders analysis. Well, what is Parks Without Borders? It's a new design approach that looks at the entrances, the edges, and the adjacent park spaces to see how we can better incorporate them into the neighborhood. On the entrances, we examine whether we need to lower the fence, take down the fence, so people have better visual unconnectivity into the public space because we know how therapeutic it is to be in green spaces. We look at the fence height and we look at the outer sidewalk. Parks close, but sidewalks never close. So we're now providing more street furnishing on the sidewalk itself. And now people can actually see into the park. And for women, in particular, there's a sense of safety by seeing your sight lines so you have a sense of comfort. Jason Park Spaces, I'm gonna show you the slide in a second. Uh, you now will see these caged off areas which make no sense. And now we're able to open them up and provide this beautiful benefit to the public. So let me give an example of what this looks like. This is Travers Park in Queens. We're very fortunate that we took a park we took a street and a nearby schoolyard and merged them all together to create a better public space. This is what it looked like. Once again, uh, you see uh, that you have you see that you have a tall fence and that you also have uh, a, this edge that is not hospitable, asphalt playground. There's a dog again. Uh, the man's not even looking into the park itself. I want you to take note to where those trees are located so you can see how this program benefits. We then created the entire new program, see where the trees are located. We created the outer park with the park. Uh, and now you can see exactly how this is a transformed public space. This is such a popular destination. Uh, you can see now the seating, how it's like an outdoor living room where people can socialize, be on their laptop and, and just enjoy themselves. I see something saying, please move this window away from, I'm not sure what that message is on my screen, um, but I appreciate it. This is the plaza, the street that was being used. And so now this is being transformed to provide better connectivity between the park and the schoolyard itself. And then this was a completed version. I want you to think about the before and now look at the after. The park is closed, but people could still go outdoors on a hot summer day, have conversations, this is what Parks Without Borders is doing, is providing such a great amenity before, which was a very stale, unhospitable environment. I mentioned how we put fences around these gardens. Here's one in Brooklyn. I don't get it. Beautiful garden. Uh, we put a fence around it, asked my staff to reimagine it, take down the fence, return it back to the public. Here's another view. We just trapped this beautiful public space, unleash it, take out that border and give it back to the public. My staff did an amazing job. The blacksmith came in, they cut down the fence, created a garden. And now when people walk by, they're smiling on their way to work. They're seeing a beautiful garden. It's bringing them so much joy. And that's what the Parks Without Borders 
is providing for our residents. I'm now gonna to move to inclusion. Uh, conclusion to me is to be included and not excluded. That's in the design process, that's in public engagement and avoid designing exclusive parks and public spaces. I can go to certain parks and feel as if I'm not welcome here, but we wanna make sure our public spaces are welcoming and safe to all and for all. Let me give an example, and I was shocked to see this. In 2017, we had signs in our parks that said you could not loiter. Now, loitering means to stand or wait around idly with no apparent purpose. Newsflash, that's what you do in a park. But based upon a law enforcement, that rule can be weaponized. If you're a nice white couple sitting on a bench, enjoy yourselves, enjoy the park. But if you're five black or brown teenagers, excuse me, you've got to leave. This rule can be weaponized. So I'm so delighted that in 2017, we removed loitering as a rule as part of our Criminal Justice Reform Act. And in fact, we went a step further. The Parks Department has an arts program. Uh, we launched with an artist a project called the Yes Loitering Project. And it's the public safety initiative. We want to investigate how teens might be excluded or targeted in public spaces and how we can develop ideas to create more youth powered spaces. So we're now telling young people, yes, you can loiter in our parks, sit there, enjoy the trees, you will not be pushed away. So this is having that lens of understanding inclusion and making sure people feel welcome. I want to show you this slide because this is Detroit. This is Campus Marsh Park. I was stunned when I saw this. This is downtown, the center of their city. And Detroit, predominantly black city, they're now on the rise. And it's a city that's really transforming itself. And the leader said, we're gonna put a basketball court in the center of our downtown. I mean, who does that? But the message was, as this city is on its way back, you young people, you matter. You're part of the prosperity. This was such a powerful message because I know in the parks world, a lot of people said, we don't want basketball because of the type of clientele it attracts. But that took courage. There's been no crime, no incidences at all. And to me, it's a powerful message of that young people, you are included. No loitering signs, enjoy yourselves. And they did this beautiful creative court. What a powerful message. And there are examples even here in New York City. This was a football field. The residents saw the demographics changing, more soccer was being played. And they asked, and I can't believe the Parks Department complied, they planted trees in the football field so that people would not play soccer. When I heard about this, wasn't very happy. We launched an anchor park initiative and now the trees are gone and the soccer field is permanently there. And now the community has a beautiful asset they can enjoy. But we have to have that lens of making sure all people feel welcome and design should follow that philosophy. I have two more pieces to talk about before I close, but I wanna reflect on these disruptions because it's been very, very difficult. This between the pandemic and everything we're going through, it has been a tough 2020, some of it bleeding into 2021. There's no question, Black Lives Matter was a game changer for this planet, not just this country. And it is one of the running protests that I participate in that people were coming out to public space to express their pain and wanted to seek change in this country. But you have to understand these disruptions caused a great deal of stress and trauma for so many of us. I don't want to read everything on this slide, but I want you to understand the residents of Rochester, many of them are going through these issues. The stress from physical, emotional, behavioral, cognitive, and spiritual. They're going through a lot of stuff as a result of all these disruptions. And it's painful to go through this. So we have to realize what can we do in the Parks Department. I'm so grateful there's something called the Trauma Steward Institute, and they came up with this survival guide. And so we embrace it to the Parks Department saying, wait a minute, all of these things can be achieved in our parks. We can help heal our residents that are going through this stress and trauma. So we pivoted very quickly and started to figure out what could we do? Because we know during COVID that parks have become sanctuaries of sanity. When everything was closed, that was a place you can go to to feel alive that meant the parks had the power to heal. And so we focused on that because people were coming out. This is Domino Park. They had to come out, so they put circles around so people socially distanced. Folks were getting very, very creative, but we knew the power of parks and public space meant to the residents. And then parks have a way of bringing joy. This is one of my running friends. We met near a park and I'm like, oh my goodness, I haven't seen Vanessa forever. 
that was the power. We wanted to make sure the power of joy, the power of healing, that we could provide this to our residents. And we did. After Black Lives Matter, my staff was devastated. So we had calls, these reflection calls with my Black employees specifically. And after talking about how they felt, they wanted to show solidarity. So this was in June. Uh, we decided Juneteenth was around the corner. We found a space in Brooklyn. Uh, we named it Juneteenth Grove. It happened to have 19 benches in the entrance, and we planted 19 trees. This was now a space for joy, for reflection, for celebration, for protest. And so we were able to create Juneteenth Grove. I uh, was so excited. Uh, we painted the benches. As I said, they're beautiful. And now we're doing these benches throughout the city, one per park, uh, so people could actually feel connected uh, to their public space. Staff themselves painted these benches. Um, I planted the tree and prayed for the tree because I knew the tree was symbolic of both going to our ancestors, but also the branches reaching up to heaven. I go by this tree about once a month. It's now, it's a road, but it's rose buds and it just blossomed last week. So it was so beautiful. I went out there just to spend time with the tree and into that space because again, it's a place for reflection, respite, celebration, and protest. We went further and started to identify other public spaces of prominent Black Americans that we can rename. Uh, this is James Baldwin Lawn and Langston Hughes, both in Harlem, so people can see themselves in the stories of these public spaces. So now I'm going to shift gears to uh, Rochester. Unfortunately, I wasn't there, but I got some images from Maria, and I got some uh, just from the web. But wow, you have an amazing Umstead legacy great parks, so you have a great platform that you have those public spaces right there. So I'm very excited and can't wait to get up to Rock, uh, to Rochester. I also know that in some of your spaces, you too have had similar protests and people conveying how they feel in the public spaces. I know this is Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial Park. Uh, and so you basically have your city center park. Uh, but as I went to look at the space, there are some opportunities. I'm sure that the Community Design Center or whatever is being planned, there are so many spaces, you know, as parks evolve over time, there can be some opportunities to do some creative things in the future. I don't want to say, you know, what that is. Uh, and then when I look at the seating area, you know, I'm thinking about that parks that afford us experience about what can we do to address this edge, but certainly a great park system, great opportunities to really reposition some of these public spaces going further. Now, I heard about Parcel 5. I'm not getting involved in the family feud. I know there's a lot of conversation about this one, but this is what I can say about public spaces. So here it is, not without the gravel, but I believe it's called Visionary Square, is that parks provide huge economic benefits. I'm not sure what the end result is going to be for Parcel 5, but here in New York City, we get 130 million, vi million, 130 million visits to our parks visits each year. And that's huge. Central Park generates a billion dollars in revenue because it's such a major destination people want to go to. Bryan Park, about double the size of Parcel 5. Uh, with 23 million investment back in 1988, the rents around this space exploded. And it is so much higher today than it was before just by inventing in a public space because this now is a place where all of the tourists all of the workers go to as their destination. And so again, that's the value of parks. Uh, I'm not sure how you're going to approach parcel five, but do want to share with you that it can have a huge economic benefit. Now I have the saying I've used years ago that we don't want to have a plan based on land uses. We want to plan based on experiences because after all, who goes downtown to see land uses? Hey, did you see that, you know, retail use? No, they go for experiences, for shopping, for dining for strolling. And so I don't just call our department Department of Parks and Recreation, but we're also Department of Fun, Health and Happiness. Every city should have a Department of Fun. So since we didn't have one in New York City, I accepted that role. They also call me the Commissioner of Fun. And so as we create our parks, we want to create these experiences. I'm going to share with you some of the things that could be done to enliven public spaces. I'm sure the Community Design Center, with the background in placemaking, you know, has the talent and has probably done this throughout the city. When I was in Raleigh, as I stated, we had the uh, our, our own urban design center. Uh, my goal then in Raleigh was to create great streets, places, and spaces, and we did that. We identified places throughout the city, invested in them, and now the public has incredible places to enjoy. 
The rule of thumb for placemaking is every city should have 10 destinations with 10 things to do in each one of those destinations. Then you know you have a vibrant and exciting city, and that's what we tried to do in New York City. So we did things like here in New York of you know, umbrellas that really liven up the public spaces, add color, add shade. Uh, that means something's going on in that space. Uh, these are places from around the world and around the country where they're using public space to be fun, to bring joy and happiness, but also get help by being outdoors. Uh, here's one, you know, I noticed you had a pole in one of the parks. This was just an exhibit in Montreal where they use LED lighting to lit up like these snowflakes. And so now people in the winter can come and enjoy and people just love this. It was a simple uh, technique and a public art project, but it really made it dynamic and exciting. And then in Boston, they came up with these adult swings that glowed at night, uh, great exhibit. Uh, we're now doing more adult swings here in New York City and seesaws. So the public is just eating it up. Want to be fun, not just a passive park, but how it could be fun, inviting and engaging. And then this is Martinique. Someone saw a tree put on a mural. How creative people are. I never would have thought about doing this, but this is the kind of thing that people are doing to make sure their landscape is fun. So as I close, uh, we don't just want to be the Department of Fun, Health and Happiness, but also Joy and also Department of Healing because our residents need us to provide that outlet and parks and public spaces is where we can get to do that. So as I close, it's our goal to create an equitable and inclusive park system and a public space system that is accessible to all and has the power to heal and bring joy to present and future generations. Thank you very much. And now I believe we're going to move to questions. Thank you so much for that uh, really uh informative, particularly inspiring presentation. Uh, it's so wonderful to see this uh, transformation that uh, you have been a part of in, in New York City. I took many, many notes through your presentation. And um, I, one of the things I love the most is, uh, you know, when you're saying the walk to the park, it's not only about proximity, but it's really about quality. And and that particular statement is so important because we, we do take these metrics and we often consider, you know, what, what are we close to? How close are we? Um, but we don't consider the fact that, is it really worth going to? Is it a place that I really want to be? So um, I know that we had a wonderful conversation happening in the chat. So I will uh, look at our questions and start to engage some of our participants. Um, I know that uh, Kevin Yost had a question. He says, can you tell us about the children's play slides that are built into the hills of Battery and Central Parks at Governor's Island and that are being replicated in a park in Erie, PA? Well, we first, because uh, people unfortunately in the parks business, uh, we are aware of lawsuits. So we make sure that all these are tested. We find out where they are in other places. We have Governor's Island the play space that's now being built in the Battery, uh, and there's a few in Central Park. They're safe um, and they're unique. Um, in the parks department, we tend not to do customized design because of cost and timing, uh, but our partners, Governors Island, uh, the Battery Conservancy, and Central Park Conservancy are doing these slides and kids love them. The one in Governors Island, though, that is long. Uh, it goes on top of the hill all the way down, so if you have the courage to do it, you can, but all those were customized, they work, but we just don't do it in the parks department, we let our partners do it. But it's an option if you wanna do it, we just go with our standard equipment that we can purchase from manufacturers versus customizing those very, very long slides. But so they're fun. I went on one of design it. <laughs> part of your answer uh, really um, speaks to the value of, of partnerships, right? The, the yeah. important roles that, uh, municipal leaders and uh, different agencies can play in, in working together to create these very special spaces. Um, Kevin also commented, and this is really intriguing to me, uh, could you tell us about the multi-layered heart that was mowed into the grass of Bryant Park at the beginning of the pandemic? I, I, I'd love to see images of that. Are you aware of anything like that? Well, so much was going on. Uh, Bryant Park is, uh, is a bid, business improvement district that actually manages Bryant Park. Uh, so they do a lot of creative things. They, so I couldn't keep track of everything going on. 
Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had to run the agency because we were essential workers. So I didn't go out. I don't think I've seen that part, but uh, Brian Park and Dan Beatum and his team, they're amazing. They're talented, but all over the city, people were trying to go out to show some love. This is official Go Green for Parkies Week. So there are buildings all over the world that are being lit up green. The Empire State Building will be green, I believe, tomorrow. So I'm sure that was their way of just showing love for parks. But I hadn't seen it, but now you make me curious. I'm going to have to go find it or speak to a Dan Oh, if, if you find a picture, please share it. It'd be wonderful to see. I know that um, a, a few years ago, uh, a group of people were trying to activate Parcel 5, and they uh, took the city logo and and uh raked it in the gravel and uh, i i think it's in one of the websites but it was it was really impressive to see how uh that vision and the care that people took to create that uh what what that meant um elizabeth murphy is uh, a planner with our uh, city uh department of planning and she asks can you talk more about what it takes to create and support active friends groups developing near the neighborhood parks that you improved? Right. So we have about 600 uh, or so groups. And um, basically, it just comes out from the neighborhood. We have a team called Partnership for Parks. So we have outreach coordinators. We do have some funding. But they raise funds. They do programming. They do cleanups. Uh, they, uh, so that's essentially what they do. They become the eyes and ears. And so we have an organization within the Parks Department that have outreach coordinators that would help them raise funds, also give them certain grants to help care for the parks. But they become those local caretakers because in New York, you don't have backyards, you don't have front yards. Your park becomes both. And so people just go out there and take care of it. Uh, so like I said, we have about 600, we support them, we give them awards, we give them grants, and they just are great. And then we do a redesign, they're the first ones at the table. So uh, like I said, 600, a uh, lot of volunteer hours, anti-litter campaign, so it's just something very wonderful, but a lot of them just approach us and just form on their own. And then we help them get stronger and bigger and engage them with some of our park activities. Thank you. Um, Benjamin Wolk has a comment. He says, what amenities should be included to represent a minimum standard for engaging public, for an engaging public space? What would you say a standard investment cost is to create a truly inclusive public space with amenities? That's well, a tough question. Each space is different. We go very closely, look at the demographics, but it changes. But I have to say one, clearly I want to make sure there's a lot of trees, large trees, uh, and then seating. Uh, far too many parks uh, just become a garden, a panorama where you can't really engage in it. So for us, seating is very critical. Trees for shade is very critical. Of cost to me having, um, uh, pervious surfaces. I prefer, of course, the lawn. But to me, uh, other than that, it depends on the community. If it's in a central business district, it has to be more of an urban type park. If it's in the neighborhood, it has to be a different type park. We have active, we have passive. When we have community meetings. We actually go through that exercise. What percentage passive, what percentage active, and then if you want to be active, what goes in it. But we have some in uh, communities where we have drum circles. You know, that becomes very important. Uh, and so a lot of it depends on the location. And then from there, we determine what is the best amenities. But clearly to me, seating and having shade are two primary elements to make sure that is a comfortable space for people to engage. It's like a living room. You say, what, what should I have basic in a living room? You need to have someplace to sit <laughs> and you need it to be cool. And then you need to look at something, could be a TV. But, you know, so that is how I think of it. This is an outdoor living room. What is essential to put in that public space for people to feel welcome? To me, shade and seating is absolute bare minimum, and then you build on from there. I, I had a, a, a question offline that someone asked me, and, and is somewhat relative to this to this uh, topic that we just talked about. Um, how important do you feel is public input in helping to determine uh, how a space might be used? I don't know that in New York you've had that many opportunities other than taking road space and creating, you know, other space. But um, we have a unique opportunity with Parcel 5 here. But there are other places, too, with the potential filling in of the inner loop. How do we um, use public input and, and what value should that have? Well, for parks, uh, I, we now have a public meeting for every single park project, period. 
unless it's fixing a boiler or it's a greenway, because basically, what are you going to determine? If it's 12 foot wide or 10 foot wide? And so we have public meetings for all of our parks, every single one. And that's what our outreach coordinators do. Now, for those that involve the public realm, I made a recommendation back in 2015 that we needed a czar for the public realm. Uh, got a little bit of trouble because I thought I was positioning for a new job, but I wasn't. I just felt between streets and sidewalks, we needed to coordinate it. So we came up with the Parks Road Borders team, and now we work very closely with the other agencies, uh, transportation, planning, environmental protection, where we now plan this together. But I certainly believe you must have public engagement. And to me, public outreach and engagement are two different things. Uh, we can go into what that means, but to me, public engagement is a very different approach that we take here in New York City. We listen more and talk less. So, and then we want to hear those stories about what the space means. We ask the public, as I said earlier, they talk to us about how much passive, how much active, and then we can have a conversation. They don't design it. They help program it in a bubble diagram approach. And then from there, we go back to our designers and we decide what's best. But absolutely, if you want to be inclusive, you have to have public input uh, and public engagement. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And an interesting comment pop up on the chat uh, while you're speaking. It says, so what do you do with public input such as that, which you mentioned about people opposing the basketball courts regarding, uh, I believe it was Detroit. Right. We have our standards. And right now, we're designing parks for all. And to my calculation, uh, teenagers are part of all. So we plan for what we want to see, not what we don't want to see. And we have very tough conversations. We make sure we reach out to the community. I remember on this one meeting, we were lowering fences and in a park in Tompkins Square. And, you know, council members started like saying, I hate this idea. Okay, let's have some of your input. Everybody was like, we hate it, we hate it. There were residents in the back that were afraid to speak up because they would have been shouted down because they loved the lower fences. So democracy created a situation where democracy couldn't take place. And so we don't just plan for who's in the room or who shows up. We go out in the community and that's what staff did. They went to the playground and said, how do you feel about this lower fence? We love it. And some said, we didn't want to say anything because we would have been shouted down because, you know, if you didn't support what was going on, then, you know, you're going to be shouted out of the room. So we make sure we do our demographic analysis. We do our outreach because we want to make sure we're planning for all. Someone have to tell me why they don't want that basketball court there. They're going to have to look me in the face and say, because I'll be very direct. Because we know uh, that it attracts primarily young people. And we want to make sure that we encourage loitering of young people and teenagers, because as far as I'm concerned, they're part of for all. So <clears throat> the city has a very important role to play in, excuse me, kind of protecting the community and making sure that the entire community is being um, reached out to. <laughs> Oftentimes, project, um, project goals or developer goals are often different from what the neighborhood or the community wants. And so I see the city needing to play this very special role in facilitating development, but also being, being kind of the, uh, the person who kind of looks out for the community and, and make sure that the community has this important uh, uh, role in the process. Is that correct? Yeah, you have to balance it out. I mean, parks have a budget. If it's in private hands with a partner, you, there's a balancing it uh, because every you can't pack everything into a public space. So you have to look at the size, look at the location, look at the demographics. And then from there, you start to establish what the program will be for that park. But you do have to balance most needs. You do have to listen to the community because this is a public space. And so all those criteria, equity, access, inclusion must be part of it. And yes, the city has to kind of play that role about how do you balance out all those needs about the location of the park, what is purpose, but also the needs of the community and avoid making it an exclusive park. Because like I said, I've been to certain parks as I go to different cities and I'm like, I don't want to stay here. I don't feel, as a black man, I do not feel welcome. And I look to see why is that? And I don't have time to share uh, all those points, but I, my antennas are way, way up. And I want to know why do I not feel comfortable in this public space? It could be the rules. It could be the food. I said, I don't eat that kind of food. You know, I, this is not for me. I can tell it's kind of a certain higher class and the way it's designed and the gardens, no seating, just walk through, walk, 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 don't sit. 
And to me, I just want to make sure I can go to a park and chill. And if I don't see a lot of benches, that means they just want me to look, observe, and walk through. That's not how I engage public space. I want to sit there, enjoy the shade of the tree, have a conversation, have some kind of food that I like to eat. So those are the telltale signs I look for to make sure it's inclusive and not exclusive. Uh, we, we do recognize the importance of, of needing to balance uh, resources, of, of course. Um, Molly Garioso asks, how would you prioritize the need to reinvest in uh, or reimagine an existing underutilized neighborhood park versus the demand for creating newer, larger parks? You have to do both. Um, I think that neighborhood parks are more intimate uh, as for the surrounding neighborhood, but then you need those larger destination parks. Each park offers a different experience. Neighborhood parks, you know, not all of them have a lot of picnicking going on, but they have play spaces, places to sit. Your larger parks, that's where you have more active recreation, where you have more fields where people can picnic and barbecue. So each park represents something different. You have your destination anchor park, and then you have your local neighborhood park. You need both because neighborhood park cannot serve all those purposes. And as you have a larger park, then you can have botanic gardens and you know, more things that attract uh, from a wider uh, market area uh, or for people to enjoy. So you have to do both and we've done both. What I push back on is that I did not want to create a lot of new parks because our existing parks really were in a state of disrepair. So as a commissioner, I said, you know, let's make old parks new again. We saw the transformation of Central Park. It looked bad, bad, bad in the seventies. Uh, we didn't say, oh, let's forget Central Park and build a whole new other Central Park. We fixed Central Park and now my goal is let's now make these old parks new again. And that's part of what the equity initiative was all about. How can I walk by all these neighborhood parks, look, all this new play equipment, I go to ours in a you know, underserved community. I'm like, what is up with that? So we focused on making old parks new again. Well, one of the things that we know uh, that we learned through COVID is, is the fact that our, our street uh, system, our roadways are certainly public spaces and they have been used uh, through the pandemic. People have kind of adopted different uses for streets. Um, we are in Rochester, a car-centric city, and it's uh, difficult to imagine that we could reclaim uh, any amount of roadway, but then I'm inspired by the fact that yeah. large cities like New York have done that uh, to a large extent, not, not just a little bit, yeah. but, but to a, a pretty extensive uh, yes. extent when you look at um, you know, different places where you've really carved out a lot of space. I mean, just think about it. We close off the center of Times Square and create a plaza. All the traffic coming in. So when people say they don't want to do it, there has to be a political will to do it. The public owns it. All of us pay taxes for those streets. It's public space. For some reason, we say it's for cars. So a person has to sit in a car, in an air-conditioned car, a heated car, for another five minutes. Oh, my goodness, that's so tragic. So we need to reclaim the public space. It's the public. And so we're doing so many examples of it. The mayor just announced the budget on Monday that he is now making some of those open streets, play streets, permanent. That's it. Cars will just have to navigate and find their way around it. But it is public space. That was the point I was making that slide. 40% of our city is in a public realm, public space. For some reason, we decided, okay, cars, you can have it to park. You know, no, uh, we are going to make sure as our city becomes more dense and we've learned from COVID, whether it's outdoor restaurants, outdoor parklets, just providing areas that are park deficient, to reclaim those streets, that's the right thing to do. The taxpayers paid for that asset. If that's the case, and maybe car owners, you know, you need to give a rebate to all the other folks who say, oh no, it was just for people who drive, because not everyone drives a car. So our perspective is it was fair game. We're not saying take the entire street. We certainly could take a parking lane. And if it takes you five extra minutes to get to your destination, oh, that's okay. There's a great podcast out there you can listen to. So one of, the, one of the things that we often talk about is, uh, you know, the need to create vibrancy, to bring vibrancy to our streets, to create uh, an environment, an experience that will support retail. And that experience happens through walking and other, other uh, means of transportation, not necessarily through driving. So have you seen proof of the vitality of Times Square or that area at the Flatiron Building improving? Um... Tremendously. Public spaces draw people. And if it's done night, it draws people. Now I was looking at your slides of Dr. Martin Luther King Park and I'm like, why isn't anybody sitting there? You know, that's what I'm looking at. 
that was Google. They drove by, I guess they didn't want to see people. But these are places that just bring a smile to your face, to breathe fresh air, to see excitement. The experiences that I was talking about, that draws people. And when you draw people, the retailers are quite happy because if they're going to sit there, they may either eat or spend money on, you know, for shopping. So yes, um, everything's connected to public spaces. You cannot have a great city without great public spaces, period. And when I go to see the city, I spend the first couple of days walking around, looking at the parks, doing my diagnostic analysis. And those cities that have dynamic public spaces, Chicago, New York, I mean, it's San Francisco, Washington, D.C., I hadn't been to Rochester, so I don't know, but I'm excited. I mean, walking, it becomes exciting. I was like, wait, we just walked an hour and I didn't even notice. There are other cities like saying, I'm walking, oh my God, how long are you walking? 10 minutes, let's go back to the hotel. So I think the vibrancy of the public space, the public realm, uh, really draws people. 130 million visits to New York City parks. That's more than the entire state of Florida. That's how powerful our park system here is in New York City. Walkable city, very vibrant, and everybody wants to come to our public spaces. And just taking the street and creating a great experience, I gave you some examples, but I know the Community Design Center, a lot of talented folks, you can do the same. We certainly have a wonderful palette to work with here in Rochester. We have some beautiful natural resources. And uh, as, as your opening photo of Rochester showed, we have these wonderful dramatic waterfalls, which could yeah. be uh, an incredible destination in and of itself. Uh, a community resident, Suzanne Mayer, asks, how do you ensure in development that access to water is open for all? I know that the industrial space along the river that has that was returned to residential, but there was a requirement to have a parkland that was maintained and built on the river. So she's talking about a specific um, plot of land where... Right. Uh, you know, which, which had industrial uses, uh, was converted to residential, but that part of that conversion required the uh, creation of a park. That's the right thing to do. Uh, in other presentations I give, I talk about the evolution of parks uh, from the time they we were inspired by United Kingdom here to today. And during the 90s and early 2000s, we had all these industrial properties that the manufacturing sector just collapsed. And what I enjoyed about it is that we healed the land and didn't give it to development, we gave it to the public. Riverside South, the High Line, an abandoned railroad, uh, Brooklyn Bridge, uh, these were all shipping places. And we said, no, 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 no. If we have this land and we clean it up, let's give it back to the public to enjoy. So there are some cases like Brooklyn Bridge Park, there's development on the upland, but there's this huge, incredible uh, public park. And now we're enjoying the river and the bay and views we never experienced before. So to me, when we have that kind of land, I tell people land is like an inheritance. You don't just want to waste it. You want to use it wisely. And when you have open space and open land, particularly by the water, this is an inheritance you just cannot give away to development. You can develop anywhere else. Plus, if you put development upland, it creates great value for that project if you have a public park next to those water features. So I do believe in water equity and access to water. That's also part of it. We certainly are very lucky here in Rochester. We have the historic Erie Canal uh, route, the river, access to the Great Lake, and uh, we're very fortunate. Um, Maria, I'm trying to read all those comments. There are a lot of comments. I don't know if I can get a copy because I'm so excited to read them all, but I know. Uh, we'll, we'll be sure to share them with you. Okay, There's a great you. conversation going on in the chat as well. I, I'm just trying to follow the questions that are in the Q&A portion here. Uh, Maria Radzinski asks, there is often pushback on park redevelopment because there may be money to improve a park, but the DPW is against it because there's no money for operating and maintenance. And we end up with before pictures in the years ahead. So uh, this is an yeah. interesting balancing act again between having the money to maintain a park once it's yeah. created. So let me just kind of decode what was just said. I went through this presentation and said that parks serve multiple purposes, helping us deal with stress and trauma. What we're saying is, sorry, we, we can't help you in that area. I mean, parks represent so much uh, that we have to find a way. There are ways you can de design parks that are more natural areas that require less maintenance. And so, you know, people look at the cost, but they often forget about the value. People think of the cost, but they don't think about the value. What is the value of having a public space where a child with autism can now go out there and experience themselves? Can I put a cost to that? No, but I know the value. I know the value of our park system during COVID. 
New Yorkers would have lost their mind. They didn't talk about cost, they talked about the value. So when I often hear that, we must find a way. We can create more natural areas that doesn't require as much maintenance and have a smaller footprint for the public to enjoy passive. We build in the opportunity uh, to have new staff and we build a park that has to be part of the equation, but we rely a lot on volunteers, these friends groups. They come out, people love the plant trees, they love the rake leaves, they love to pick up litter. So if there's a will, there's a way, and you have to make sure these parks are sanctuaries of sanity. And to say <laughs> to the public, sorry, you can't have that, breaks my heart a bit because I know the importance and it helps deal with climate change by absorbing CO2. There's so many benefits to parks and to say we don't want one of those, I find a little bit shocking. So it's, it's kind of uh, the way that the uh, entity has to kind of create its value systems and goals right. to determine how these spaces will, will develop. Right, parks are essential infrastructure. Then they also have to say, we don't want a new road, we don't want a bridge, we don't want new pipes, you know, that we can't afford it because we can't maintain it. We cannot put parks in that separate category. It is now essential infrastructure. And if they're consistent saying, we don't want to build more roads because we can't maintain it. We don't want to build more sewers because we can't maintain it. We don't want to build any more bridges because we can't maintain it. But, oh, parks? Oh, no, that we can't build because we can't maintain. So I just think that it's about choices. And like I said, it's cost versus value. And I truly see the value of parks and public spaces. Uh, William Price, our board president, says, thank you, Mr. Silver. You quoted... Um, Frederick Law um, said about the role of the sidewalk, Jane Jacobs stated that the parks are only as successful as the land uses around them. Do you feel that the adjacent land uses need to be successful to create a successful park? Yeah, I, mean, I would answer yes, because I always believe as a planner, if you look at the context, go bigger. Uh, certainly in Raleigh, North Carolina, we had more square that was redeveloped and we looked very carefully what was surrounding it. There was a children's museum, there was a market, we made sure that the edges related to the public space. But in many cases, it's just all residential. So I think the answer is yes, you certainly have to pay attention to the surrounding context. What I said earlier is that you have some neighborhood parks that are passive, some that are active. So I would agree with that. I certainly would agree. And I'm a big fan of Jane Jacobs. So I'm never going to criticize her or say that she's wrong. God rest her soul. Jared Joan. Uh, states, Rochester, like New York City, has a very strong and vibrant skateboarding community. Can you speak to what role you have in bringing back the iconic cultural landmark of Brooklyn Banks underneath the Brooklyn Bridge? Would be curious to hear about the park's relationship with DOT in bringing this back. I don't know specifically because Brooklyn Bridge Park is run by um, one of our partners at Brooklyn Bridge uh, Cor Corporation. Uh, and it's a public-private entity. Uh, we have skate parks all over the city and we involve young people in designing them. And I know this is shocking. Some of them, we allow, we don't remove the graffiti. We let them customize their skate parks the way they want to. So if you go to New York City, like saying, oh my goodness, look at all the graffiti. We, we let them tag it and do what they want to do. Uh, but we do have uh, a huge skating community. Uh, even the TF, which is called a train facility at Tompkins Square, mistakenly, I was going to synthetic turf it until they found out that thing was legendary. Uh, so we have a very close relationship. We're now looking at something called a skating garden. Uh, we want to play somewhere in Brooklyn, but I'm not as familiar with the one that you're referring to uh, under the Brooklyn Bridge. I do know that right now, uh, Roebling uh, Plaza is being built under the bridge to connect the two parts of Brooklyn Bridge. So I don't know if you meant the Manhattan side or the Brooklyn side, uh, but I'm, I've heard about it, but I'm not that familiar enough to respond. Elizabeth Murphy uh, makes a statement that uh, is, is often, that we often are witness to. It says, public safety and illegal activity are ongoing issues in a number of neighborhood parks. What are some successful non-police models for addressing and improving public yeah. safety in these spaces? Well, we activate them. Good uses push out bad uses. Uh, Bryant Park was notorious of being drug central. Uh, we took down the fences around it. We activated with so many activities. And that was one of the most beloved parks in New York City. Good uses push out bad uses. And if we do have law enforcement, they educate before they enforce. A lot of people don't know they're not following the rules. And then our volunteers. I mean, some of these moms and grandmoms, they go in there and they can talk to these kids the way I can't. Uh, and so there's some respect for the elders. And so our partnership groups, teaching our, we have park police. Uh, my role, and they know it, is to educate first before you enforce. 
and then we activate them. And so we've done that in a number of places and it tends to push that activity away. Also the parks and outdoors, by removing uh, all those barriers where people can hide in these crevices, it's now more open. And some people don't like doing bad behavior when it's out in open air. So lowering the fences, removing some of the shrubs, more lighting, better sight lines, tends to diminish. And in New York City, as big as we are, 1% of all crime in New York City, one less than 1% occurs in our parks, less than 1%. A great statistic. I was reading an article recently about the ongoing protests in Portland and the something came up in the article to talk about the, the fact that there isn't a place where people are able to protest. We in Rochester have taken uh, Martin Luther King Park uh, at the beginning of the year last year. Uh, the city allowed for it to be painted black and to become this dedicated space mm -hmm. for people to, to use as a, a site for protest, but also to express themselves. How important is it to have these types of spaces? Well, in New York City, we certainly support someone's uh, First Amendment right to, to protest. And so we have them every single weekend. I'm actually honorary co-captain of running to protest. Uh, we run and protest about every other week. We're in the streets, we're in the parks. Uh, so we, it is someone's constitutional right to protest. Uh, and so it does happen in spaces. Occasionally it gets tagged up that we have to remove it. Uh, but from the streets to the parks, uh, this is a city where the, the police department stands down unless there's some major issue, but typically there isn't. And so uh, we allow protests in our parks and all the squares, Union Square, Washington Square, I showed you an image that was East River Park of all those runners. We tend to wear white. Uh, they're peaceful protests. We have a megaphone, no amplified sound, uh, but it is a person's constitutional right to protest and we allow it to happen. So I don't know what, how they do it at Portland because it, it is a public space and you can't deny someone's constitutional right to protest. And now we have Juneteenth Grove, which is now becoming a, another popular destination because of the colors. And I think the mayor is even going there on Juneteenth, not to protest, but to have a celebration. Yeah, I, I, I love the images of, of that, that Juneteenth Grove and, uh, and everything that it stands for. It it's a, certainly seems like a wonderful place. I'll look forward to visiting it next time I'm in New York. Yeah. I think I'm going to just do one more question and then uh, we will close There's out this presentation. There's a question about re-envisioning. I, I know in the comment, re-envisioning MLK Park. You know, let me know. Uh, I'd like to come out there and hang out and participate in that one because I, I didn't want to say it, but it, it can. You know, you want to update your park every 20 years, I think MLK Park. Maybe yeah, well, certainly you know that you are welcome here anytime. You have friends, and all you have to do is when you have the time, just let me know, and we'll we'll make sure to hook you up. Okay. Um, Arian Harbovitz is a, a, a local urbanist. He states, amazing presentation. Can you speak to the importance of not just having parks, but the improve, uh, improving the sidewalks, trails, and streets that connect those spaces to neighborhoods and to each other? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think all cities need to reimagine their public route. We all know they were built around automobile, but the grid, the grid, the grid establishes your public realm. And far too much land was given to cars and not enough to people. People are walking and biking and scooters and all modes of transportation. So the question is absolutely. As a parks department, we oversee the street trees as well as trees and parks. And so we are re-envisioning, whether it's bioswales that we put there, but we're trying to re-envision the sidewalk uh, as something very, as the main walk and not the sidewalk off to the side. So absolutely, it's owned by the public. I would encourage Rochester to do their analysis to find out what percentage is parkland and what percentage streets and sidewalks, and you'd be astonished. And so I think there's some inequity there uh, for some reason, giving cars all that concrete when it could be re-envisioned and serve a greater purpose. So I will agree with that urbanist that is all fair game. In fact, that is the number one conversation happening globally since the pandemic is what, how we're gonna reimagine. And New York City has this initiative called 25 by 25, where they wanna have 25 miles of road going back to the public by 2025. So this is catching on all over the country. When people see all these outdoor dining areas and these parklets, streets that didn't look great, it's like, oh my goodness, I actually had a slide I didn't have time to show you about what's happening here in New York City. I'm sure like in Rochester with all these outdoor dining, it's making, some of them are so cool. Now they're getting architects to design them. I'm like, oh my goodness, I love this. And the mayor's extending it. <clears throat> so great question, great opportunity. 
re-envision your public realm, neighborhoods, downtown, all over. It'll be money worth and well invested. Thank you so much, Commissioner Silver. I can't thank you enough for a truly uh, inspiring and very informing presentation. Uh, it, it really is a wonderful template that we can use to follow, uh, you know, advocating for uh, impacting policy regarding our green space and public spaces here in our community. I look forward to hosting you here in Rochester at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, I know that you are, uh, you're moving from your position shortly. Can you share with us what sure. uh, the future holds for you? So uh, I'm appointed and my term ends in 2021. I love this job and I would love to stay forever, but it doesn't work that way. So I'll be joining a firm. Uh, they're based in North Carolina called McAdams. They're landscape architecture, civil engineering, and urban planning. So starting in end of June, early July, I'll be a principal of that company and I'll be splitting my time between New York and North Carolina. So I'll be back and forth uh, practicing most likely there, but anywhere around the country. So I'll be excited uh, to start helping others around the country and around the world, uh, make sure they pursue great public spaces. Well, we wish you all the best uh, in, uh, in this uh, very wonderful and exciting future for you. And uh, again, our thanks to you for taking the time to join us here today. Uh, we just have a few closing slides and, uh, and we will be finished. So thank you everyone for joining us. So please join us for our community conversation that follows uh, this presentation next week. We have Molly Gadioso, Arian Harbovitz, and um, Andre Primus facilitating the conversation next week. So we invite you to please register on Eventbrite and join us uh, same time, same place next week. And up next, we have Dr. Destiny Thomas for our May presentation. So we look forward to, to that in exactly, uh, exactly a month from now. And lastly, again, please do fill out your survey. We are really, uh, we, we do look at all the uh, responses to the survey and it's a great place for you to share information about the types of subjects or speakers that you might be interested in hearing about. So we look forward to getting your feedback on that. And with that, I just wanna thank everyone for attending. And uh, again, special thanks to everyone who's been a sponsor and to our speaker, uh, Commissioner Silver, as well as for the Mayor Warren for joining us today and introducing our speaker. Thanks everyone. We'll see you again in a month or so.